Gordon Benfield Smith. <laughs> Benfield's an English name. I don't know where that one came out of the background. Oh, February 25th, 1924. I've got my discharge paper, and so the size of that top one up there. My brother uh, uh, was, uh, he's about five years older than me, 24. He went, in, he went in quite a start there. My father and mother came down to see me graduate at 12. And, uh, but the day that I, they came down to see me graduate, they came down to also tell me, just before they came out of the house to come down to Guelph, that they just got a telegram overseas that my brother was killed the same day that I graduated. He was a pilot, and he'd been over, he was an instructor here for, for two years, because he was in early. Went over there, and he was in a squadron over there. So he was out on a, a training flight, and there was some of our own aircraft coming back from Germany. He was just over England, and the two crashed on the same day that I graduated. So my mother came down to see me graduate and uh, tell me that he'd been killed the same day. How, his name is Bill William, William James Smith. I went overseas about three weeks later. So he died the day I graduated and I was gone as well, but I, I was fortunate. I went in the service when I was 18, so I was a flight sergeant and I was paid $5.90 a day. <laughs> but then again, everything's gone up, but that's pretty low. But I, I went in the Air Force, well, I don't know, looking back on it, I had never, the Army didn't appeal to me. The only reason it didn't, you'd be talking sometimes, like talking when I'm about 17, 16, my father's friends in the First World War talking about trench warfare. And that's mud and <laughs> the Navy. There's the bed to sleep in, there's there, that, for your head, you're lying down, it's about that far from a steel beam here. You could kill yourself if you went down a, in a hurry. So that put that out. And then they came down to the Air Force. I thought, well, if I get in the Air Force, I had a, a, a nice place to sleep at night. And the only time you were really, sort of really, truly working was on an ops, and, which was, here that was not one thing on its own, but. Oh, and also, if you went in the air crew, you automatically got a, a commission and or an NCO, you released that. I went in and I, of course, I think anybody, if they're really going in the Air Force, they're really keen on, I'm going to be a pilot. So they wanted me to become a gunner. And I thought, God, I didn't want to be a gunner. i tell you, there's one thing I think would help here. You know, I used to be in the 48 Islander bands, brass band. I said, it, it would be a great help because I was a musical. And uh, the Morse code is da 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 I converted my knowledge of re reading music and blowing a horn to going da 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 da. The pilot is the only one who's honestly busy all the time. The uh, two gunners, maybe, unless you're attacked, you don't go looking, you're not a fighter, you're a pilot. So you're sitting there, and if nothing happens, if nobody comes after you, then you're sat there for the whole run. And the same thing goes with myself. I use the key a couple of times to send messages or return them. Uh, the navigator, you need a navigator, that's right. And the pilot, you need a navigator and a pilot. The bomb aimer goes up in the nose for Oh, maybe 20 minutes. He, as you get towards the target, he's up the nose. He drops the bombs, and then he goes back and sits. One fellow at this retirement place I'm at came in there a year ago, and he sat down. And uh, then he mentioned he was in the Air Force. Oh, okay. And I said, what were you? And he said, oh, I was a wild operator. So I, either he or I, I don't know which it was. He came back with that, and he says, did it, did did da did it, did did it, da 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 And he came back, and he came back, did it, did it. Hello, hi. <laughs> and the people at the table thinking these guys are nuts. <laughs> and we went on the Queen Mary. Oh, where she's on the Queen Mary. And you know how many were on that ship? It usually carried, I think, around 35 or 4,000, uh, maybe. Uh. And then when you come off the ship, we came off in Edinburgh and Glasgow, up in the Clyde there, you're up on deck waiting to come off. It took about oh, four hours to bring them all off. And as you're looking down, off came, oh, maybe 100 nurses. <laughs> and they, you never saw a woman on that ship for five days. Nowhere. To get into Europe, England, France, France first, you've got to go east to west. You've got to cross this. And I think it ran for a number of miles. So you had to kind of run the gauntlet and get over it, you know. Yeah, we got hit once and that was it from that. But it didn't do any harm. I was coming off one day. We're out at night trip. We get back around just sunset or you no know, gearing up. And in the morning it was still dark and I'm walking down the aircraft but the sun was just coming in the window. 
of the plane just enough. And I just happened to glance up and I saw a little hole, or two or three little holes with the size of a toonie here and there, up in the... You know, what it was was uh, flak, as far as I know. It's, it goes up as a bomb and explodes into maybe a hundred pieces. And if, it, if these little pieces hit a pilot, hit the engine, or hit the right spot, he's done a fair bit of harm whatever you're doing. And of course, searchlights, that's the biggest part too. If you're going over the target, there's always searchlights. And if, uh, if you get caught in, or even if it flashes by you, because that does happen, they're all over the place. As soon as that goes by you, you're, you're glad it didn't stop, because once it stops, it's got you in the light, and it's kind of, once they seem to lock in, they can follow it and keep you in, and then they come in, instead of one on you, if it's a certain one, one of them seems to be able to bring in five others, maybe, and then you're in a cone, and it's a lot more difficult for the pilot to get out of that. But uh, we weren't too often uh, caught in the lights, or sometimes. One spot, it was only about five, ten minutes, and there seemed to be a solid wall of flak coming up. And then once you got beyond that, you're all right. I'm in the plane looking out the window, and all of a sudden down came a cluster of these, maybe, I don't know, let's say just ten of these incendiary strips. But they were spread out. But one of them was definitely coming down, and it did. It went right in the wing, went in the top, hit the far outside engine, started to fire, and then went on down. It didn't explode or anything, but it started to fire. So now the thing is, uh, our pilot, he sees his automatic right there. He put the, they had built an extinguisher in there, so that he put that on, but I thought we were gone because the engine was on fire and the whole plane not flying the way it should do. So we had to come back on three engines. And anyway, we got through it, he got the, he put, oh yeah, that's right, he said. He told us to get ready to jump. And uh, when you jump, you've only got two feet and you're going to 170 miles an hour. You can't more than that, move more than an eighth, an eighth of an inch before you hit this. I don't know how the hell it worked. You either had to go over the tail place like that, and you're going to jump out and your body's going to be like that. And what he did was he did evasive action. He was going back toward home now, empty. So he, he says, hold on, get back and sit in your seats. He put into a steep dive like this, straight down. And a Lancaster was not exactly a, a fighter. And uh, he went down, I don't know, he went down maybe 5,000 feet. But it, he, when he pulled out, the uh, fighters were gone. Uh, he saved, well, not, it would, certainly prisoners of war, but maybe even lives by doing that move, you know? No matter where you're going, there's a possibility of going to another target. So they send a message to me, I'm on the plane actually, and I just, and I tell the pilot, instead of A, it's B and you're in the middle of that, so then they, you change the course. The idea is that once you start going in, in a straight line, they, they know that, the radar knows that. They know that you're going north, straight north towards uh, maybe some major target, but that doesn't mean that. If they want to, they give you a change, and you don't know that, nobody knows it until you're in the air, and then they send the message, maybe half an hour in the air or 20 minutes. There were some targets, uh, the Ruhr Express was one. It was very heavy industry, you know. There was a, uh, it might have been a 200 foot high mountain or own, but there was a large man, I don't know if it was man made or not, like a big cave, but I'm talking about maybe 200 feet or more. And there were submarines go in there. It was a submarine base. Now, I don't know exactly the size of it, but that was a target. Now, there's a special kind of a target, though. Something like the dam buttress, because had to come in and, uh, drop it at a certain point, so the idea was it would go in, you can't. Bombing it from the top was no good because it was a, a sitting in the bottom of a high hill. You gotta head it before it hits the water. You wanted to get in that opening, a big opening, mind you. But it's gotta be time to just get it to go in. And we did that a couple of times. It's, running into a target, any target, baby, some of them were extremely heavily uh, uh, searchlights and fire, gunfire, you know? You had to really, really run that last 15 miles to just get through, drop your bombs and go. I would be going in sometime in the bomber, just twice it happened, but a major target, I don't know which one it was. And uh, he's coming in, he's left, right, left, right, left, right. And he says, there's a pilot, and he's maybe maybe three miles from the actual target. He says, no, take it, I don't like it, Captain, take it around again. Now, <laughs> everybody in the crew would have shot him, because nobody knows the difference, you know, he's, he's He's, he knows what he's doing, but he's right in there, maybe three miles from the target or closer. 
And at that point, I wouldn't know whether he was on the target or on the moon. So he could have just got to the mouth shut, pressed the tit, and uh, nobody knew the difference. The better one than that, the DFM for NCOs, I got the DFM. And what you got, I got it for in my case, at least, was uh, instead of coming back for the uh, uh, leave, you know, which I could have got, and the pilot and the bomb ever, and the pilot myself, out of eight. I stayed on, the rest came back. No, and in fact, you know, you know in Pathfinder, we never dropped bombs, eh? It was always uh, flares, or markers. The reason we went on, got onto the Pathfinder squadron was, they look at his past. The Pathfinders all started on a, a regular squadron, they eh? run. But then they look at if he's, once he's got 10 or 15 trips in, they look at his hit choice, or one, and they say, oh, Pathfinders. I think I had the luck of the draw, and I guess I think, if anything at all, the, the pilot, because he, uh, the one time there when he, uh, when he got into trouble and uh, he, oh, we were caught in the search lights, yeah, and we were coming back, and we just left the target, and he was coned in the lights, not that one leg goes by, but when you're coned in the light, they seem to be able to move with you. He said, hold on, and he just put that, turned and steeply and took a steep dive, we're, we're 20,000 feet maybe, so he took a steep dive, and I think that saved us because they kind of had us coned in the searchlights. But when he took this dive, and it was quite a dive, uh, I'm sure in that case he, there was a good chance we would have been hit or the, uh, any aircraft. On your last two trips, you're doing this master bomber, but you circle the target for the whole time. But if it's a major target like the Ruhr, and you're over target dropping one load just like our, I was, or we were, you drop it and you're gone back. But when you go over there and you arrive at the first one to go in and you circle, the idea being that, let's say the marker that you dropped or somebody's dropped, and there were different colors, you know, and if I'm the master bomber or deputy going around this way, I will say, uh, roughly speaking, the green one, the rough idea to ignore it, you know. Well, there were many of them who didn't come back, you didn't see them again, huh? I don't know, never met anybody that would say a prisoner of war because I just didn't see it that way, didn't see them. But there were a lot of errors, never. You'd always know the next day how many didn't come back, you know, but that didn't mean they were dead. It just meant they were prisoner of war or dead.